So welcome to our first uh, front-end tech talk uh, for Pico. So it's uh, our first event since uh, the confinement for uh, COVID-19. Um, so before we are doing a full stack tech talk, we decided to move uh, to a full front-end uh, front talk. Uh, we have the opportunity to have uh, today uh, Mark Wittfeldt, who's a uh, the lead of the core team for NGXS that will present us something about um, simple state and smart selectors. Then uh, Jessica Cao will tell us a little bit about design system and the evolution of design systems uh, in Criteo. And then uh, Luisa Ciccone will uh, tell us a little bit about do's and don'ts of um, ERIC.js. So just, um, so during the webinar part, there will be uh, no question. So the, um, our presenter will just do their talks, but uh, I'm sending you a link where you will be able to get uh, links towards uh, different breakout rooms where you can go and uh, discuss with the, um, with the different speakers, ask questions and so on and so forth. So I hope you will enjoy uh, the talks. Uh, and now I leave the floor to Mark. To Mark. Hey. Hey. Hi, everybody. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, welcome everybody um, to my talk about optimizing NGXS. Um, my name is Mark Whitfeld. Um, the, the talk is, is speaking about uh, simple state and smart selectors. Um, just a, a small background on myself. Um, I have been developing software since 2002. I built my first website in, in 1996. So that was, that was just before JavaScript. So frames were all the rage in terms of creating interactive websites. Um, I'm passionate about open source software development. I'm the NGXS core team and I'm involved in various other, other projects as I need to be. Um, I'm passionate about uh, quality software development and advocate for any practices that, that lead to better quality software and in the end, um, better experiences for customers and for developers. I'm a big fan of TDD and other human-centered development methodologies, ones that create a safe place for, <clears throat> for developers to be able to work in and for companies to receive value from the development uh, work that developers do. So in starting this talk, I would just like to establish the following premise. So the most valuable software developers write simple code, testable code, maintainable code, and human code. So what is NGXS? You, you may have heard about it, you may have used it, um, or, or it might just be a four letter uh, word that means nothing to you. Um, so NGXS is state management for Angular. Um, as you can see with the NG at the beginning of the word, um, like everything else in Angular, it starts with NG, um, X, just because um, there were versions that would, uh, would circulate in Angular from NG to, four, five, et cetera, et cetera, and S for state. So it's state management that is designed specifically for Angular. So there are, there are four different um, aspects to your, to your application um, that you just, work in. Mark, yes. just a quick question. Are you trying to share slides? Is the... Because we don't see anything on the... Okay. Okay, please hold. I am sharing some slides. Share screen. So what are you seeing? Are you seeing my slides now? Yes, we are. Ah, there we go. That is fantastic. Um, if it was just my face in the beginning, I'm sorry about that. Um, but um, here are my slides. So let's get back to this. Um, okay, so NGXS is state management for Angular. Um, it has really three main components. Um, you have your, your actions, which is the way that you communicate with your state. You have your state. And then you have uh, selectors, which is how you query information and gather information out of your state. Now, every application that we work with deals with data. 
Some of that data might have come from the server. Um, some of that data might have come from captured user input. And during create the creation of the application, you need to come up with a strategy for how you deal with the, the, that data. Um, especially if it's come from a server, you might need to cache that data or combine multiple uh, calls and pieces of data from the server in order to represent it on, on the screen and components to your users. Um, you also might need to capture data from your components and potentially combine that with various other forms of state to eventually send back to the server so that your application can perform its intended purpose at the end of the day. So NGXS is a, is a library that assists you in, <clears throat> in managing this data and in your data management. It leverages decorators, classes, dependency injection, and all of those things that, that we are very familiar with in Angular. And one of the things that I really enjoy about it is that it gives, gives a place for the intelligence of the application to live. I come from, from a world in the early 2000s where we wrote, where we wrote Windows Forms. And um, Windows Forms, it was really great for getting an application going quickly, but very quickly you had a mess. And you, you would see applications where people would, behind a button click on your Windows Form, would call the database directly in order to, to manage state in the application. And we've seen this sort of thing start, starting to happen in Angular, Angular applications. The components are our new form. We add more and more code to our components. And you see these components that, that are, they, they really grow and they, they become almost these God classes. And this is not a great way to architect your application. You need to have an, have an approach that is going to assist your application to remain simple as it grows. So um, the other thing that NGXS does is it follows the CQRS pattern. Um, you might be familiar with this term. You can have a look into it later if you want to. Um, it stands for Command Query Responsibility Segregation. And it's basically the idea that you would want to decouple your writes and your reads to your data within your application. So the commands in the NGXS are your actions and your queries are your selectors. Okay, so let's, let's just take a 10,000 foot view on NGXS. First of all, we have our actions. I hope that you can see that, that code slip, snippet at the bottom there. Um, as you can see, it represents a message or an event or a command in your application. It should be reveal, uh, revealing of its intent. For example, load recipes. It's pretty obvious what that does. It has a type safe payload. In this case, it's a recipe type, which is a string. And the other thing to note is that actions are multicast and they have a life cycle. Um, the life cycle of an action is something very unique to NGXS that many of the other state management libraries do not have. Um, actions are multicast in the sense that you can have multiple states in your application that receive the same action and do their relative response to this action. For example, a logout action might get all of your states to clear their data as you log out. Then we have the state. As you can see in this code sample, the state is declared like any other service in Angular and it has an additional decorator at the top, which is basically saying that this is a state class, uh, where it should be, uh, what it should be named within our, within our global state. And it represents a subset of our application's data. In, in your application, you will have multiple states and you can, um, you can have them as large or as small as you want to. I would advocate for having them smaller and more singularly focused. The state has a model for the data that it stores. As you can see here, there's the recipes state model. And you can inject Angular services for side effects. As you can see here, we have the um, recipes API services, which is being injected into this, this class. Um, the other thing that it has is it defines hooks for how the state handles the actions. So within this class, we would have a method declared like this um, with an at action decorator on it. So this, this method has been hooked into the at action um, action that's going to be dispatched with our ap application. And as you can see, it's accessing the API, retrieving data from the API and 
patching that data into our state. If you've dealt with other state management solutions, um, you would often be familiar with seeing um, a pattern of having load recipes, load recipe success, load recipes failure, um, in order to manage the different phases of this life cycle. But in NGXS, we have first class support for async handlers and side effects. So this, this simplifies our code a great deal and we can use um, really great um, things like async await and, and things that a junior or an apprentice developer would find easy to understand because it looks like synchronous code. Lastly, we have our selectors. So the selectors represent a query of your state. And as you can see in the, in the code sample, it has a selected decorator to state what data it's receiving of the recipe state. That data will come into this, this um, function as an argument. And then we can do whatever processing, in this case, we sort, sorting the items and return that data. This is a pure function. It's very easy to test. And these functions are composable. This function can then be received by other selectors in order to compose more and more advanced state. The other thing is that your selectors are memorized, which means that the output is, is cached based on the input arguments. So if you receive the same input arguments again, it doesn't redo the calculation. All it does is it return, returns the previous result. And then lastly, how does our component collaborate? with our state, that's through the actions and the selectors. So this is what a component can, can look like. We use the at select de decorator in order to receive our sorted items from our recipe state. And that is connected into the, this recipes observable variable within our component. Also, if we wanted to select a, a recipe and communicate that to our state, we would dispatch the select recipe action to our store in order for it to respond to that and potentially save what the selected recipe name was. Um, the other thing that NGXS enables is that it it's enables minimum, uh, minimal RxJS complexity. You don't have to be merging streams and doing all those um, complex things with observables. Um, you can merely expose your selectors as an observable and use it directly on your component using the async pipe in order to manage your subscriptions. Um, because of the use of observables here, our components are, are fully reactive and they support the on-push on change detection strategy. As you can see, our component has minimum code, beh code behind and it very easily connects to our store in order to represent the data in our application. Lastly, NGXS has many useful plugins. <coughs> Sorry, these are just a few um, for easily connecting, connecting Angular forms, the Angular router, um, saving your state into local storage, um, displaying things through the logger, connecting to Firebase, using the Redux dev tools, and there are many more. So simple state, smart selectors. In your application, you will have, have multiple pieces of state that you would want to interact with and often from multiple different views. In this case, I've, I've been talking about, uh, I talk about views and not components, but you can understand that this is a, this is a view, something that would be shown to the user, uh, whether it be in part of a page or a whole page. They need to receive parts of information in order to display to the user and interact with the user. As you can see, there, there, there are many different pieces of the state that are used by many different views, and this is often, as your application advances and gets more complex, this is, this is what starts to happen. Many, many times I've seen developers start to make their states more and more advanced. And this is what I'm advocating that you shouldn't do. You should keep your, your state to be raw data. Now you might think, well, how do we, how do we reuse um, information that might be displayed in two different views? Information that is not just, uh, not just in the raw data, but somehow needs to be assembled. And this is where I'm going to talk about smart selectors. Selectors are really the amazing power of state management. And as I get into to the code, you'll see what I'm talking about. So the principles that, are, that I want to speak about is that you should store raw data in your state. And this is your captured input 
your uh, service state that's come back from the API, you should do minimal trans, uh, transformations on this data, but just store it in a raw format. Then you should create classes for composing selectors. Um, I call these query select classes. And these are just purely classes that have these static members on them um, for all your different selectors that you might want to use. You can create um, different classes representing different aspects of your domain. And then lastly, create view specific selectors. So these view specific selectors would be composed from your more general purpose selectors that are found on those query classes. And what I like to call these classes is, is that these are the, my view model query classes, representing the model that as closely as possible represents what's the, what the view needs. In this, case, in, this, in this way, we can eliminate much of the code that we would find in our views and optimize it through the use of memoization that comes along with selectors. So let me introduce the example that we're going to work with. It's the NGXS Dino. We have a restaurant which receives orders for tables. We have a kitchen that prepares the orders and we have a stock room that supplies the ingredients to the kitchen. We have orders and recipe as our state and we have a, a number of different views of this coming from stock, kitchen, ordering, or perhaps a recipe list. Okay, enough talk. I'm sorry about all the talk. Now show me some code. Let's make sure that um, I'm still sharing. Okay, so this is our NGXS Dino. Very simply, we have our tables. We can go in and we can order a curried beef stew. We'll have two of those and some of those other things. And let's say we want three pizzas, maybe one less stew. Now our, our order for our table is settled and we can choose some other things to order. Some of these things I can't pronounce. It's quite a fancy restaurant. And now we can go and look in the kitchen and here is the production schedule for the chef. He knows what orders need to be produced in order to fulfill the needs of the, of the patrons. And here's our required stock. So all of these, these ingredients and the amounts, the combined amounts from all of those, those orders um, is represented here for someone to go and fetch the, fetch the ingredients from the stock room or perhaps go to the shops if this is an upfront ordering system. So this is a very simple, simple application, but there's multiple views of the same data. So let me show you the code. Onto the screen. Okay, so we have our application and in our application we have our kitchen, our restaurant and our stock and a shared recipes component. So in our restaurant, we have a number of states. We have our orders state. It's a very simple, simple model for our orders where in our order we just have the table name and we have the, the choices from the menu that they've made. The other state that we have is a table state, which just represents the, the tables within the, in the restaurant if, the, if they wanted to configure their tables differently. So we have our restaurant homepage, and this is the one that you, you saw with all of the tables. If I have a look at this component, minimal lines of code. Table view model queries, don't get view model, that's all, that my, that's all the data that my application needs. I'll go to my tables view. Okay, it's got some boilerplate code there from my, uh, my material sample. But very simply, our components have minimal code behind. Uh, for example, this is where the, um, the users are, are then, sorry, where the patrons are then ordering from. And as you can see, they're adding, the, adding their choice from the menu or removing their choice and they dispatch those actions. The state then receives those actions. And you'll see for opening the table, closing the table, adding the table choice and removing the table choice. Very simple code representing those actions. And that is the essence of the state management for this application. Now in the queries for my, for my application, I have this orders queries class, and here from our order states orders, 
I can get, um, this is quite a fancy named method, but basically it returns a map of, of how many orders have been done for each, uh, for each item. And also um, which, which recipes have been ordered and the counts of those recipes. This that then gets used in our view model um, query for our order. And we can combine all of this information in order to represent this on our, um, on our, on our tables view to see our, our tables. If we then have a look at our kitchen, in our kitchen, the kitchen page is once again, very straightforward. And we have our view models. And all that this does is it selects from our orders queries, get all ordered items count map. Um, it's a map so that we can easily quick, uh, we can easily look up for each item um, what the count is. And we basically create our production sheet from that. If we go into our stock module, I'm flying through this code. If we go through our stock module, once again, it follows the same sort of pattern. We have our stock view model. And we've got our ingredients queries, so we can get our ingredients orders, which is here. And once, once again, this is composed from one of those more generalized selectors. So these selectors can compose into each other. This is probably the most advanced selector in the application, probably room for some refactoring here, but we can count the number of ingredients and the amounts of each ingredients that we need. And this is the application. If you have a look at the code behind, there is literally no code behind our components. All, all of this intelligence is held within our state management and within our selectors. Let's switch back to the slides. Still sharing. Great. Okay, so what did I just learn? Um, <clears throat> I demonstrated the principles that I was speaking about. We store the raw data in the state we create classes for composing selectors, and we create these view-specific selectors to represent our view models that are displayed in our components. We have some very simple um, principles that you can follow, but this should lead to much more maintainable applications, much more testable applications, much, simpler to under, much more simple to understand, and in the end, much more human code. Code that a junior developer, a senior developer, anybody can read and make sense of. Thank you very much. I'll be available afterwards for questions. I'll be posting a link to the slides and the code on Twitter after the, after the talk. And also you can follow at NGXS store on Twitter for any NGXS related news and updates. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um, yeah, so I will be sharing again the link for the question and answer later and now I will give the floor to Jessica. Hi. Don't forget to share your screens. <laughs> Am I sharing now? Yes. Okay, great. Hi everyone. My name is Jessica and I'm the tech lead of the shared components team at Critio. We're responsible for building and growing the Critio design system which provides tools necessary for our external facing teams to present a consistent and user-friendly interface across Critio products. So in a way, we serve two user groups, the designers and engineers at Critio who use our design system directly and the end users. Today, I will tell you a story of our evolution in the last year, where we went from hosting pure CSS styles to building a full-fledged library with usable components and templates. What is the Critio design system? A design system is a collection of reusable components guided by clear standards that can be assembled together to build products. This set of visual and language components is shared between teams. Um, I see something in chat and I'm just going to double check. Okay, thanks Mark. Guided by clear standards that can be assembled together to build products. So it is a single source of truth throughout our organization. At Critio, the guiding principle in our user experience is to deliver consistency and simplicity. We want the users to feel that they understand what they see. They know what to expect and they can trust our interface as much as they trust our products. Why do we need a design system? A design system lets our designers and engineers reuse components and increase our efficiency. It introduces a shared set of principles and rules 
to build components and create consistent ex experiences across our entire platform. It allows us to build faster products at scale. This is important when you're working with multiple cross-functional teams of designers and product managers and engineers. If every team built all their own components from scratch, they will definitely come up with products that are inconsistent and confusing to the user. So I want to show you an example of some UI that needs improvement. And I thought it should be from our own platform. Why pick on someone else when we're not perfect ourselves? So here's a list of campaigns from our platform. Here's a list of budgets. They're both lists to display information. Both have various filtering and search and both have call to action buttons. They look and behave very similarly, but it's different enough to be inconsistent and potentially confusing. This is why we need a design system. When, de when designers design two things separately or when engineers make their own decisions on implementation details, you end up with custom CSS and discrepancies that look bad and confuse the user. As you can see, even though we have a design system, we still have room for improvement in our process. So what is our process? The request to create a new component or to update an existing one can come from anywhere, but it usually has to go through these four steps. First, user experience designers create wireframes to define the interactions that the component provides. They might conduct research to learn about the positive and negative points of an experience they find out how the experience makes a user feel. Was it helpful, friendly, straightforward, or was it confusing, frustrating, challenging? UX designers take those learnings to make improvements that positively impact the user's experience. They focus on the overall experience, not the visuals or specifics. Next, user interface designers validate the wireframes and produce specs. They pay attention to adhere to Critio design system standards. They try to use existing atomic elements as much as possible. They're responsible for the look and feel of the product. Then engineers on the shared components team build the component and add examples of how to use it on our demo website. Finally, after the components have been validated and documented, they're ready to be used by all engineers at Critio. We try to keep this process agile. The steps are actually more like this. We always try to keep communication open and validate with other members of the team what we're doing. So I might be building a component in the third step, but I'll do quality assurance with designers to make sure I'm correctly following the spec they produced in the first and second steps, and also share my work with the engineers who will be using the component in the fourth step to make sure that what I'm building serves their needs. Communication is important at every step of the process. Now that we have the same vocabulary and context, Let's start the story of our evolution. We're a small team and we wanted to hit the ground running and immediately deliver support to the rest of Critio. So we started by forking the Angular material theme. It's a big library maintained by Google with ready to use components. It's already well tested by a large global community of active users. It's used by many developers, including many new hires joining Critio. So if they're already familiar with Angular and standard Angular material components, that makes onboarding a lot easier. We knew we would want to build on top of it, but we could do that with an incremental approach, addressing needs as we discover the business demands. We made for a great starting point, and then we customized it with Critio branding and aesthetics. Some styles were automatically applied. For example, we defined a border radius on all of our buttons. So when an engineer uses a standard button component, they get that style by default without having to specify anything on their own. Other styles could be invoked through a class name. Here's an example of a group of radio buttons. An engineer can wrap a radio, radio group component with a div with the Critio radio button class to give it a whole set of styles, like the Critio color palette, the rounded corners, the margin, and the alignment of the buttons. We gradually started to style more complex components and groups of components. For example, this is a group of radio cards each with an icon, a title, and a description. Engineers can invoke all of these styles with the utility classes Critio Radio Card and Critio Radio Icon. The responsive attribute at the end applies a CSS grid layout to the group of buttons to automatically render them responsively to fit the screen size. For example, these buttons will be rendered in a single column on a mobile phone. At the end of last year, we tackled a big project to revamp our user experience. 
As part of that project, we created designs that involved more complex components and templates. We gathered all of our designers together to tackle this challenge. This gave us the opportunity to look at our platform with a big picture, bird's eye view. It showed us opportunities to present the user with a more consistent and thus clear and friendly user experience. We needed to do more than just style the most fundamental elements. Elements don't exist in a vacuum, and we need to define how they interact with and combine with other elements. So we created a new library to hold these new reusable components and templates. This was important to achieve consistency for the end users, not just for the atomic elements, but for the more complex ones as well. We wanted the same look and feel across our platform so users can know what to expect when they encounter the same component, the same template in different apps across Prettio. It would also improve efficiency for both our designers and our engineers. Components could be designed and built once and ready to use always. If we need to update a component or fix a bug, we only have to do it in one place because the code is not duplicated. As you know, whenever you have code distributed across many repos trying to do the same thing, that often creates confusion, redundancy, and bugs. So having a library of reusable components is also more robust. It also allows us to leverage specialized skills. Most of our engineers are full stack engineers. By providing a library of reusable components, we reduce the need for every team to have a front end specialist. We try to minimize the amount of custom CSS that engineers need to write when using components from a library. This also goes back to the point above as it contributes to efficiency and de developer speed. Finally, it bakes in good practices. When we want to incorporate a good design principle, for example, responsive design or accessibility, we can do it directly in the library and reduce the need for every team to invest separately in the effort. Okay, let's look at some real examples. Here's a basic card component in your library. It contains a header, in this case an image, a title, description, and some buttons. This card component is built as a custom HTML tag named CDS card. CDS stands for Critio Design System. The engineer provides the content with predefined attributes. We take the content and project them into our component. The engineer does not have to write custom CSS. To show you a slightly simplified version of the code side by side, on the right is how we built this card component using a basic matte card component and content projection. And on the left is how an engineer would use our card component by filling in the content. As you can see, we are using multiple slots for content projection. Um, in this case, the CDS card header is highlighted. Here we have CDS card title, CDS card content, and CDS card footer. In addition, responsive design is baked directly into this card. It will lay itself out based on the device screen size. On the left, where there is enough space um, on a desktop or a tablet device, the card looks like this. On the right, when there is not as much space on a mobile device, the card looks a little more condensed. We built all of this into the component directly, so engineers don't have to do anything on their end and can get the correct behavior by default. That way, not everyone has to learn about different media queries and breakpoints. There's less chance of errors or inconsistencies, and if we ever need to update our breakpoints, there's a single place we need to make the changes. Here's another example, a lightweight inline edit component. It allows a user to quickly edit a piece of text inline. It looks like a text label at first, but if you click on it, it toggles into an editable input field like this. There's also a customizable error checking for the error state. For an engineer who wants to add this component to their application, they just have to provide some data with the input properties and observe the output events. The component will take care of predefined interactions like toggling its own state between display, edit, and error. So everywhere this component is used, it will have the same familiar look and feel. It's all encapsulated in the component. The engineer can specify what the initial text is. In our simple example, it's a hard-coded item name. They can specify what the placeholder text is. In our example, it's a hard-coded name here. And they can also specify an error message if there is one. In our example, it's bound to the error message variable, which will allow the engineer to specify the custom error validation. We intentionally abstracted away this business logic so the component can be more robust and reusable. Some applications want specific error checking. For example, maybe only letters can be entered. 
or the input that can't be longer than 40 characters. Or in this case, the input can't be empty. But some applications might want something different. For example, in one use case, this inline edit component is used to let users update a custom nickname for their campaigns to help them differentiate between multiple campaigns that they could be running. And we actually want to let the users enter whatever they want with zero error checking. By keeping the component as dumb as possible and letting the parent component handle the business logic, the component is more robust and can be easily reused. Just to show you a simplified version of the code in the inline edit component that specifies the input and output properties. This is how data flows between the parent component and the child component. As mentioned before, a library of atomic elements and even components are not enough. Elements don't exist in a vacuum, so we need to define how they interact with and combine with other elements. The logical next step in our evolution is to build reusable templates. Templates combine multiple components and handle their interaction with each other. It makes sense to have reusable templates for exactly the same reason to have reusable components. Consistency, efficiency, and scalability. Here is a template that can be used for a creation process. For example, to create an ad campaign. This is an important process with many steps. So we want to show a recap on the left of what the user has already entered, broken into steps and substeps. We also show if the input has been validated or not. One of the interactions that we enforce is whether a step is validated. It's only validated if and only if all of its substeps are validated. This checking is done by the template, so the engineer using it doesn't have to worry about the implementation details. After this template is built, any Critio application that needs to display a creation template can reuse this one without building their own. And on the other hand, every application that uses this create template will have the same look and feel. A user who's gone through this flow once when they created a campaign, for example, will immediately recognize it if they then go on to create, for example, a budget. When they see the same template, they'll know what to expect and they'll know what to do. To summarize what we've seen in all the previous examples, what have we done? We built a library with reusable components and templates. We use Angular content projection with custom HTML tags, attributes, and classes. We pass data between the parent and child components with input and output properties. This allows us to take care of handling internal interactions while avoiding getting tangled in complex business logic. So we can make the components as dumb as possible and they can be easily reused. In our design of the components, we balance the need to let developers customize the component with the overall goal for a consistent, standardized looking field. Finally, to tie everything together, I'd like to show you our demo website. So this should have switched to the demo website. Um, this is an internal platform we built and used to showcase all the tools available in our design system. That includes design tokens, which are the fundamental core styles and the foundation of our design system. For example, here are the colors in our Creo color palette and the recommended usage, um, of different ways to use it, uh, different font sizes, recommended usage, how they can be used um, in combination with the different colors. And uh, what do we see in the demo buttons? So we have a uh, code viewer here that shows an engineer who wants to use this component, how it should be used. We also saw, radio, saw this radio card earlier. So here's the radio card in um, the demo with guidelines of how to use it. And we can resize this to see that it changes into a single column display when we're in mobile mode. Inline edit component from before. I, mean, I can show you how it toggles between the different steps. And then I think the last thing we looked at was this recap stepper. And here's our API for a developer who wants to use this. So that's our design system demo. It's a single source of truth for all of us to use together. Let me go back to
Okay, my slides are, okay, there we go. So now we have a growing library of reusable components and templates. We're adding more as we discover the need. And we're constantly looking for ways to improve our coverage and better serve our users. So what's next? We are currently actively making our user experience more mobile and tablet friendly. We are looking into improving accessibility and we're experimenting with interaction design. We would love to evolve our library to also include web components as well. Right now, our library is only Angular compliant. It would be cool to become framework agnostic one day. That's our story so far. Thank you for your time. I hope this talk was interesting. We have one more tech talk today, so if you have any questions, please save them for the end and join us in the Zoom room. Thanks a lot, Jessica. Luisa? Mm -hmm. oh, super eager to hear you tell us about RxJS. Hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. That's good. That's good. Great. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about do's and don'ts with RxJS streams. Yeah. So to start a bit about me, I'm a full stack developer who has been working at Quito for about a year and a half in the Grenoble office. And we mostly work with Angular and .NET Core in our applications. And um, well, in my previous jobs, I worked uh, a lot with Angular, some Node.js, .NET, mobile technologies, etc. And about my pastime, I like to do mountain sports, basketball, music. Okay, what about our team? So we are working on the management center, which is an advertising platform for our clients. And in the center of uh, our business are the marketing campaigns. So for example, we have a Black Friday campaign and uh, we have a budget which is associated to this campaign and we have some, uh, some ads. Okay, so in this uh, application, we are usually doing a lot of asynchronous work. So doing asynchronous work in JavaScript has not always been that easy. If you remember this kind of code, so doing uh, callbacks for asynchronous work, um, there was a bit of a problem because we had a lot of um, indentation, the code was very complex, it seems a bit dirty, you don't know where the actual code is. Uh, error handling happens like a lot of times and that's when promises arrived. It was to solve these kind of uh, problems. So we changed to something like this. <laughs> well, the problem is that usually everybody I think was sometimes in the, at first um, had this problem that when replacing callbacks with promises, you did not solve all the problems because there are some simple stuff to remember, like always return the promises and chain them one uh, below the other. So in this case, the code is much clearer. We know each step what happens and we have a single error management code and if something arrives in either of one of these handlers we know well we have only one place to, to handle this okay and uh, now promises seems like seem like a long time ago because there's this new guy the observable so uh, the observable star is um implemented in, in JavaScript, um, so it's RxJS, the library, implementing the ReactiveX project. Uh, this project, so Reactive Extensions, was created, I think, around uh, 2012. It was first created for .NET, and then uh, there was RxJS, it was the implementation for JavaScript. And uh, at first, it didn't look a lot of uh, what it is today. So I think in version six, there were a lot of changes and uh, it's closer to, to what we are using. So in the center of um, RxJS, there's the observable, which is a stream of events. And 
well, this is what uh, they present RxJS to be, is load dash for events. So it's imagine arrays, each value is an event emitted over time. Okay, so to compare the two, the observable and the promises. Um, the observable, as I said, multiple values over a period of time. Um, promises, they have like uh, only one value because at first they're in a pending status and then they can be either resolved or rejected with a single value. Observables uh, have this great thing that they can be cancelable. So if we think about the HTTP request, we can cancel the HTTP request easily. Um, they are also lazy. That means when we are creating an observable, is, the code is not executed uh, right away. Uh, but promises the code is executed even though we do not attach any then handler um, after. The observables on the other side, when we subscribe, this is when the, the code is executed. And also observables can be unicast. It means that each uh, execution can be independent. So if two subscribers are on the same observable, the executions might not well are, happen independently, whether promises are only multicast. And one of the great, great things of observables are the operators, which are really powerful. And if you ever tested Bluebird with promises, they kind of seem alike. So the powerful operators. We have lots of lots of stuff. So I did the comparison with Lodash. So we have the same uh, operators like working with collections. So from can transform an array into an observable stream. We can do maps, filters, reduce, partition groups, etc. Then we have some which are more specific to events. So we can create an event, uh, for example, from the clicks, user clicks. We can do the throttle, buffering. We can do lots of stuff with HTTP requests. We have easy, easy uh, error handling, cancellation, retries, which are more, uh, uh, more easily done than with promises. You can do an exponential backup if you want, polling. We have a lot of operators for combination and a lot of other utility operators, like TAP, which was also in Bluebird, which is uh, not changing the which is used usually for logging, for example. Okay, so if we want to have the same code as uh, previously with, with operators instead of promises, what do we have? Okay, this is not what we want to do. We do not want to subscribe multiple times, uh, maybe only if you want to do a trick to your teammates. But what we want to do is to do the same as with promises, is to chain. Um, so we have to chain. This code is less complex, more easily tested because we know each time where the error is, uh, we know uh, each step of the way, what happens to our uh, stream. So here we have load the campaigns, we filter only if the campaigns uh, have a, a value. Then we load the ads for these campaigns. Then maybe we can select only the images for these ads and then like create a, a final banner with these images. So this seems pretty straightforward. It's easy to read and also really easy to test. Okay. Um, one of the first things I was wondering when I started working with uh, RxJS and, uh, and operators is that I usually saw switch map used uh, when doing requests, but sometimes I saw like the concat map, the flat map, and I, I was wondering what was the difference between all these observables or, or these operators, sorry. And that's what why I decided to do like a small demo. Okay, if this works. Okay, so I did a small stack list to um, demonstrate the, the difference between uh, these four operators. Um, so I have a small simulation of the HTTP requests. As you can see, I'm only using the observables 
um, I'm logging uh, the time ticks so it can be more easily seen when the requests arrive and they are sent and they arrive. Um, I'm simulating some user interactions, so the, like the user does, does something uh, each second. And then this is my actual code. So I'm taking the source, which is the user input, for example. Um, I'm logging just so it can be obvious what, uh, what is going on. And then first operator, which I'm using, is merge map. Okay, let's see how this is. Okay, so my source emitted A, B, C, D, and then the requests are launched right away. And we can see that the responses uh, do not arrive at the same time. So just for the info, I simulated the first request to be the longest and the last the uh, shortest. So we can see that we launch A, B, C, D in this order and we receive uh, in the not the order is not uh, guaranteed because uh, the request might be longer than the others. So, if we imagine a use case, we can take like for our example from NJXS, like the recipe ones. For example, users are clicking on different uh, different orders, and we want maybe to search the orders um, with a search the the ingredients of the orders with a nesting request. And we do not care if uh, maybe the ingredients list is uh, formed uh, in, a different, uh, in a different order because at the end we want to receive everything and we want to receive it as soon as possible. So launching the requests as soon as possible is better. Okay, now the, oh, sorry, the, uh, the concat map. Okay, the difference with the concat map, oh, sorry. So the source emits in the same order, and then if we you can see here, only the first request is launched. When the first request arrives, the second request is launched, and so on. So uh, as you can see, concap map um, waits for the inner observable to the get data to finish before subscribing to the next value, to the next observable. And this can have uh, various of uh, use cases, maybe uh, doing some polling. We want to get some data, wait for data to arrive, and then uh, launch the next request just afterwards. Switch map, which has a really, really nice feature, is that um, you can cancel the previous observable so only the last one is kept. So as you can see, the source emitted A, so we launched the A, then we launched B, so that means the request for A is cancelled, we launch C, the request for B is cancelled, we launch D, and then only the response arrives at the end. So uh, also uh, several use cases for this, when you want to, when a user clicks a, an update button multiple times, you only have want to have the last update, so the others are cancelled uh, in the meantime. And the last one I wanted to show you is the exhaust map, um, which I didn't see uh, a lot of time used, but has a particular um, use case. So it's, it does a bit the um, inverse of a switch map. So it launches a request for A, and then it ignores all the other requests that arrive in the meantime before the response for A. Uh, so this can be maybe used in a like pull to refresh button. So if the user is like pulling to refresh several times, you don't you launch the request until you have the answer. There's no need to launch other request functions or the request. Um, yeah. Okay, that's for the example. Uh, if you have any questions on this, uh, we can see uh, at the end. And what I wanted also to show you, if we go back to, to our example, um, one of the things I think is important is that to keep the observable stream flowing. Um, operators are pure functions, so there is a um, the, the most important thing is to think that 
if you can use observables, the subscribe must be, uh, must be kept to the, to the minimum. So this code is correct, but when using observables, you have to think reactive and not the classical imperative kind of way. So the same code can be achieved like this. We are selecting the campaigns, we are filtering if there's something selected, and then we are, for example, computing the total on the budget. So mapping the budget properly. Um, so this is thinking reactive, and also what uh, happens is that we can easily change some other uh, functions, um, other operators uh, afterwards or in between. For example, we can also filter if the budget is not empty, or we can also add some uh, logging in the meantime. Okay, so we talked a lot about subscribing and what to do and what not to do. What about unsubscribing? Okay, so very important when subscribing, when you think of subscribing, you think of memory leaks. You have to avoid memory leaks, so you have to unsubscri unsubscribe. Uh, so how can you achieve that? Is using the, that unsubscribe on a subscription. So we are creating our subscription and then we unsubscribe later on when, for example, navigating away for a pay, from a page or we don't need the subscription anymore. But what happens if we have lots of other subscriptions? So we have lots of other unsubscribe and then when we can stop one of the other can be a little bit tricky and it, well, the code can get pretty complex. So we can unsubscribe better with a tick until. I think you all saw this uh, tick until operator. Um, because it's really, I think everybody uses it now to unsubscribe. So we are creating a subject. Um, it's like a notifier, which when, for example, the, we navigate away from the page, we emit a value on this, um, on this uh, subject, and then we complete the subject. What happens is that our observable is taken until this notifier emits a value. So we completely unsubscribe at the end. So what happens is that we can put this take until stop on all the other observables, or maybe it can be a take until navigate away from the page, take until hit another button, etc. So it's more um, it's more easy to, to to handle. We also can use maybe take or take while on several use cases. For example, take one if we are interested only the first value emitted by the selected campaigns, which is different for from an empty array, we can take only the first value. So this makes the, um, the stream complete right away. And just a small tip, when you see filter and take one, you usually have to think about first operator, which is a simplification of the first filter and take one. The small difference is that first uh, emits an error if um, no uh, value emitted by the selected campaigns passes the predicate. So it's better to, to specify a default value. So in my case, I specified an empty array value. Okay, but maybe even better, do not subscribe at all. So we're working a lot with Angular and in Angular, there's a sync pipe, which is really great because it subscribes automatically on the, on the data. It unsubscribes automatically when you destroy the component and uh, it, um, it handles everything for you, so you don't have to think about subscriptions and unsubscriptions. So with the same code, I'm just putting my, uh, my, my banners into, into a value. I'm not subscribing to it. So this is when, I'm, when, the comp when the, my component is using this value, I'm subscribing. What another advantage for this is that we can extract all this in a service, like for example, my banner service, and the service is just um, returning a flow. My service can be unit tested really easily and then my component is all clean and just has some data for, for some service and there's no actual logic inside. Okay, to sum up, what I wanted to, to pass, uh, my message I wanted to pass is you have to think reactive, so use the operators, maybe even abuse them, they are really powerful. 
you don't hesitate to read the docs. There's a lot of examples there. There are a lot of documentation, use cases, etc. Really, really good uh, source. Experiment. So you can use Stackbits or CodePen or favorite uh, favorite uh, IDE or everything. You have Eric's Marbles, which was uh, which is a visual experimentation of um, of the observables and how each operator impacts the the, the streams. And also test, you can use RxJS Marbles, which is a testing library, uh, really, really easy to use and really visual. So don't forget to test. <laughs> so thank you very much for uh, listening to my presentation. Hope it was uh, interesting. And if you have any questions, uh, join us afterwards. So that we So. Just um, so we have, we should be able to access this page. So this is the link I will put once again in the in the chat. So uh, basically, we are going to have forums. So one with Mark, one with Jessica, one with Lisa, and uh, the last one will be with uh, me and Audrey. If you want to uh, learn a little bit more about um, crypto, so we are likely to be there next uh, half an hour so see you in a minute bye bye If you have any issue with the uh, with the link, uh, don't hesitate to ping me. I will be there for one minute, one additional minute. Okay, we'll close the webinar now. See you.